Do you care about social justice? Are you an educator? Looking to teach about social justice issues, but not sure where to start? Welcome to the Challenging Assumptions Workshop, co-hosted by TeachKind and the United Federation of Teachers Humane Education Committee. This is a recorded version of a live virtual workshop that we conducted. Please sign up to receive TeachKind e-news and get on the UFT Humane Education email list so you can learn about all our upcoming workshops and other events. TeachKind is PETA's Humane Education Division. We work with teachers in schools around the country to help them integrate compassion for animals into their curricula. We do this by conducting teacher workshops, doing outreach at education conferences, providing free lessons and resources, and working with teachers directly in their classrooms. All of our materials and services are offered at no cost to educators and schools. Gail, can you please share a little bit about UFT Humane Education Committee? My name is Gail Furkowski and I chair the New York City United Federation of Teachers Humane Education Committee. We are a professional committee that was created to help reach teachers in order to have them turn key humane education to their classrooms. Here in New York State, this is a New York State law and it requires humane education be taught in the schools, but for which many teachers are unaware or unsure on how to make this happen. We are there to help you. The link you see on the screen will take you to our website where you can view our past newsletters and events, upcoming programs, learn about our board members and link to free resources and lessons that you can use in your own classrooms. Please visit our website and mail me directly to be placed on our email list so you will receive our information first. Mention humane education in the subject area. Thanks, Gail. In this workshop, we're going to talk about a revolutionary way to discuss social justice issues with students using TeachKind's Challenging Assumptions curriculum. Here's a short trailer of the video that's included in the curriculum to set the stage for our discussion today. The full video is 15 minutes but the trailer's only a minute and a half long. Bullying and violence don't stop at the human door any more than they stop at the race or gender door. Why draw a line between humans and other animals? Why not take a stand against all needless violence, all discrimination, all injustices? There's plenty of compassion to go around. If we're to recognize other animals as the unique individuals they are, with unique personalities and interests, and rich, complex inner lives, we have to stop treating them as objects and passive caricatures in the very words that we speak. We created the Challenging Assumptions curriculum to help engage high school students in identifying societal assumptions and values that negatively affect others, like the idea that humans are superior to all other animals, or that some animals are to be cared for while others are to be used for our personal gain. This is a first step in empowering students to be consistent in their beliefs, and it'll help them ensure that their behavior and actions are justified, leading to improved interactions with peers, as well as greater kindness toward all sentient beings. We encourage every educator to discuss racial inequity and other social justice issues with their students. And challenging assumptions is a tool you can use as an entry point into these topics, which are very politicized and polarized right now. This agree or disagree sheet is part of a lesson from challenging assumptions. You can visit teachkind.org slash agree disagree to complete it. You'll see how it can prepare students to engage in a thoughtful discussion with their peers, getting them into a good frame of mind to think about issues that may affect them on a very personal level. And having no right or wrong answers is important here. I'm 
Elizabeth Chiravoga. Before I came to work at PETA five years ago, I was a classroom teacher in New York for 12 years and a coordinator for English language learner programs. And I've served on the executive board of UFT Humane Education Committee for over 10 years. I share my home with two cats, Cloudy and Spuds, and the spirits of my beloved dogs, Quincy and Ellie. I'm Megan Snyder. I've been with Teach Kind for just over three years. Before that, I taught middle school English in Virginia for a couple of years. I'm Google for Education certified, as well as certified by the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development in building trauma-sensitive schools. So technology and trauma-informed practices are two things that I seek to incorporate into Teach Kind's resources. I think you'll find that challenging assumptions makes good use of both. I share my home with my two dogs, Owen and James, and my husband, Austin. I spent the last 15 years as a special education in English and reading intervention. Now, although, as many of you know, being a special ed teacher can throw you in so many subject areas. I also taught sciences, which certainly affords humane education lessons. I'm a certified humane education specialist. And if you're interested in knowing more about how you can become one, the link to the Pro Social Academy can be found on our UFT Humane Education website. I also ran a Teens for Animal Rights Club in my school where we took students to local city council and state senate hearings on animal related legislation. And until recently, I shared my home with Smoochie and Rigby, my beloved cats. My name is Mike Farley and I'm a middle and high school geography teacher. Um, I've been teaching for about 20 years in Toronto. Um, and I'm currently just in the midst of finishing off my um, MN degree in humane education through Institute for Humane Education at Antioch University. Um, I've been incorporating animal protection, animal issues into my classes for about 10 years now, um, but increasingly more so over the last few years. And I'm um, also um, in the midst of organizing a conference called Educators for Animals, which is going to bring together hundreds of educators from around the world who are interested in incorporating animal protection into their classes and school communities. And I live with my uh, wonderful wife, Nandata, and my beautiful doggo, uh, Sophie, uh, here in Toronto. We will also have a special guest presenter whom I'll introduce in a few minutes. Now I'm going to ask you to move just a bit. Shake your hands in the air, and then clasp them together. Now do it again, but this time with the opposite thumb on top. How did it feel the second time? A little different, a little strange. That's how you might feel when hearing new ideas and perspectives. So I'd like to ask you to keep an open mind. New perspectives encourage growth. And just as we teach our students to improve, grow, learn, and change, well, that's good for us as educators too. Working with different people can expose us to different ideas and perspectives that can lead to the accomplishment of our goal of educating young people, not just academically, but also socially and emotionally. This activity is great to do with students, and you'll find it in the teacher's guide. You can discuss with students how the thumb activity might feel uncomfortable, much as it might feel uncomfortable to challenge assumptions that they've held for most of their lives. You can let students know that as they explore topics of social injustice, privilege, and bigotry, they may feel uncomfortable or have trouble understanding new concepts at times. So you do what you always do. Assure them that your classroom, either in person or virtual, is a safe space where they can share their thoughts and feelings openly. We'll start off with a guest speaker who will help us explore how we as educators can examine how we feel about social justice issues in order to present them to our students. Then we'll review the components of the Challenging Assumptions curriculum and the rationale for scaffolding the lessons in a certain way. After that, we'll discuss practical applications and some concrete examples of ways to use the curriculum in English language arts and social studies subject areas. And finally, we'll wrap things up and offer some additional resources for your class. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Kimberly Spaniel, Dr. Spaniel is a researcher and professor of criminal justice and sociology at Iona College in New York, as well as a licensed mental health counselor and behavior analyst with nearly 30 years of clinical teaching experience. 
She specializes in green and non-speciesist criminology, humane education, and individual systemic behavior change, and has developed and teaches courses such as animals and criminal justice, animal and human health, species justice, environmental crime, and environmental justice. She also serves as a consultant and trainer for Integrated Justice Solutions Incorporated and develops humane education and ethical animal-assisted interventions across settings, trains mental health providers in linked violence, and is currently developing an ethical animal-assisted intervention clinical training program and a critical animal studies minor program, which will examine the intersections of human rights, animal protection, and environmental preservation. Thank you so much for having me here, and I am very honored to be here with you. So we'd like to start off by posing this question. A lot of educators are interested in animal rights and other social justice issues as well. Dr. Spaniel, can you talk about intersectionality and the connectedness of all these issues and why it's important for educators to examine their own feelings about these issues before presenting them to their students? I think that the exploration of how what essentially for me is uh, how animal rights is a social justice issue really needs some uh, grounding and, and, and real attention um, to that concept. Because I think as humans, we are so indoctrinated from birth uh, to believe that we inherently have some kind of privilege over other animals that sometimes even for people who really uh, do care about other animals and want them to be protected and want them to lead happy and safe lives have a difficult time uh, really understanding what happens to them in the current systems we have in our world as a social justice issue. And I spend a great deal of time in my classes really exploring this. Uh, so I'm gonna address it like I do with my students, which is really taking them on what I look at as a journey um, to really explore their own attitudes and beliefs and thoughts and language because it's all connected. I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist, you know, I mean, among other modalities, but for me, I know how important thoughts are. And when we are taught to think about non-human animals in a particular way for most of our lives, it can be very difficult to frame uh, their experience as a social justice issue. So one of the things that I always talk about with them is this uh, theory of intersectionality. And this is a theory that was developed um, in 1988 by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, she's a legal scholar. She's a black woman, black female, who started to talk about her experiences as both a woman and a black human and how each of those uh, identities intersect and create experiences for her uh, in their own way and in their, in their own combination, if that makes sense. So just as race and gender um, and a myriad of other identities um, are things that we all experience, we often as humans don't think about our species um, as part of our identity. And because of our species, we do have inherent entitlements and protections that other species don't have. Um, so I think one of the things that's really important to understand is that uh, if we can frame animal rights as a social justice issue, we can start examining our own privileges and the privileges that we deny to other species just because they aren't human. For a lot of my students, it's a lot of cognitive dissonance, which I will talk a little bit more about later, but basically the idea that our behavior and our thinking aren't aligned. And when we realize that it feels uncomfortable. So sometimes I'll have students who are really fervent animal, you know, uh, human rights protectors, you know, come into my classes. I teach criminal justice because they really care about the justice system and equal justice and human rights. And then when they start thinking about uh, the experience of animals and the injustices that 
happen for non-human animals and they start seeing themselves as part of this system of oppression that's causing so much suffering and cruelty arbitrarily just because of someone's species, it's really uncomfortable. So it's really important, I think, to really uh, spend some time thinking about that, digesting it, um, examining our own thoughts. There's no, you know, it's not about making someone wrong or making someone feel like they're an oppressor. We're all part of this system. You know, we've all created it in some ways. We all live in it. We all exist in it. And then we get to thoughtfully think about how we want to live and proceed in a different way, possibly, if that doesn't feel right to us. I remember I had a student get really angry at me in class um, and he yelled at me. And I said, what is this about? Where is this coming from? You know, this emotion. And he said, because I hate bullies and, and I'm starting to feel like one myself, right? So I said, okay, this is really interesting. Let's, let's just talk about it. Let's just be curious about it, right? Let's have an opening and be curious about it. And you mentioned something that I also want to address that I think is really important. Um, when we are looking at these um, issues of intersectionality and identity and how it impacts us in the world, right? I mean, non-human animals are often victimized because of arbitrary, uh, even thoughtless choices that we make on a daily basis. Um, it's important that we know how we feel as educators about that. You know, some of us might not be so clear about our values um, around this issue. And if anyone's watching this, they probably care about it enough to really start exploring that for themselves and thinking about that for themselves. And uh, um, I always like to use this analogy of uh, when I went through mindfulness uh, training, I, was, I went through a training, a certification on teaching mindfulness to youth. And one of the uh, people in my training uh, said, yeah, you know, I, I keep telling them to meditate and to practice and they just don't. And one of the group leaders said, well, are you practicing? And, you know, they said, no. And you know, there has to be some authenticity there because people can smell it when there's not, right? So uh, particularly young people, I mean, I think all people, but you know, youth are, are really gonna pick up on that. So I think modeling your message and being really clear about your uh, feelings and thoughts about this is something to significantly spend some time examining. So just be curious and think about how intersectionality um, impacts non-humans and includes non-humans, uh, which isn't often done. It sounds like the root cause of oppression is the dehumanization and objectification of different groups. Can you talk about the consequences of dehumanization and objectification in and beyond the classroom? There's a lot of research on human moral attitudes. How do we develop our morality? How do we develop our belief systems, our choices, our thoughts, our behavior severely impacts others around us. And throughout history, when we dehumanize other humans or we objectify other humans historically and presently, it gives us a justification for really um, allowing them to experience a great deal of suffering. The same is true for non-human animals as well. So um, because of our privilege, because of speciesism, because we think we're inherently somehow uh, better or more deserving than other species, generally speaking, um, you know, that might be an idea for some people. What do you mean? Dehumanization? They're animals. How can you dehumanize an animal? Um, and that's inherent in, in speciesism, right? That's an inherent in our, our moral attitudes and our belief system that humans are inherently somehow better or more privileged. And when you really look at that, you can see how we allow the atrocities to non-human animals occur. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that, right? I mean, there, there's uh, these concepts of cultural violence, of structural violence. You know, we are taught from a very young age, whether it's through religious ideology in some cases, or art, or science, um, all of the institutions of learning that we uh, develop our belief systems from are inherently speciesist. And the truth is that humans would not be where we are today 
if not for the suffering of non-human animals. I always ask my students, well, what are some other systems of oppression and violence um, that have occurred that some groups have benefited from while other groups suffered that were once commonplace and legal and no longer are? And of course, uh, you know, there are many examples that we can think of previously and currently. And I will say, you know, they always say slavery. <laughs> they always do. And it's a hot, right? It's a topic. It's a sensitive topic. Some people get angry because how can you compare a non-human to a human? I mean, I understand that. I get that. And systems of oppression and violence are, uh, have more in common, uh, right? We're talking about the system, that process of thinking that someone is inherently less valuable than you are then provides the justification for treating them and objectifying them in any way that will benefit you. And it becomes something that doesn't even seem wrong after a while. In fact, it seems right. And I think when we really start looking at our values and how we want to express them in the world, um, and we take a little bit of a step back and get curious about that. I know for myself, once I started to make those connections, I was lucky enough, honestly, I, I, I'm grateful for it and I consider it a privilege that I learned these things when I was in high school, when I first middle school to high school. So I think that dehumanization and objectification process, once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's like those optical illusions. You know, is it a duck? Is it a bunny? Is it, a, is it an older woman? Is it a young woman? I think you know what I'm talking about, some of those famous optical illusions. And in fact, in my slides, I have one, uh, it's a photograph and it could be a black poodle coming out of the woods with snow, or it could be a man walking with a backpack into the woods. You know, some people see the man, some people see the poodle. Uh, but once they see it, once you point it out, how did I miss that? It's the same kind of thing, right? How we see the world influences our thoughts, our language, our behavior. Uh, there is a very famous um, uh, uh, adage which looks at beliefs, right? Our thoughts, language leads to our beliefs, our beliefs lead to our habits, our habits lead to our character. And we get to choose that. Um, so one thing I always say to my students, because sometimes I'll be honest with you, I have students sometimes that say, well, after we go through this whole process, they're like, well, what do you, what do you want me to do? Do you think you want me to go vegan? I'm just trying to help them identify their values and live their lives in accordance with that. Um, because as a therapist, I think that brings true happiness. Um, but I always say to them, I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to know there's a choice. And when you can't even see a choice, I do have a problem with that. If you see the choice and you choose to do whatever you're going to do, okay, but at least there, you know that there's a choice. There's an awareness of choice and a consciousness. And one thing I will add, you know, people are always searching for happiness, right? I mean, it's like this elusive goal that we all have, but don't really have a clear definition of it and don't really know when we attain it. Um, but I think happiness is when we clearly identify our values and then make behavioral choices to live our lives in alignment with those values. Um, and for me, uh, when I realize that there can be consistency with the way that I choose to treat other humans and the environment and non-human animals, I got it. It was like the light bulb clicked. My victimization is tied with other non-human animals. COVID is a great example of that. Uh, my suffering is tied with other non-human animals, right? Other humans and non-human animals. And so is my happiness. And, and so is my ability to survive and thrive. Um, so I, I really give that a lot of um, thought and a, and a lot of consideration and respect in how I choose to live my life. And I think that's very empowering for people. And I think living a purposeful life uh, really is a source of happiness. Thank you, Kim. Great ideas on living a purposeful life. 
Now I'm going to review the components of the Challenging Assumptions curriculum. We have our teacher's guide, which explains the rationale and objectives of the curriculum and includes the opposite thumb on top warm up activity we did earlier. Part one of the curriculum includes four lesson plans that build on one another to lead to the powerful 14 minute video featuring the firsthand stories of two activists of color. It explores the ways our everyday language and actions can either reinforce or challenge ideas of power and supremacy. Part two is designed to be used throughout the school year as you continue to teach the same lessons you're already teaching using the standards mandated in your state. In this section of the curriculum, we break down the subjects of English language arts and social studies into broad themes, such as reading and writing or civics and economics. And we provide recommended lesson plans, activities, and other resources from our website, along with suggestions from classroom teachers on incorporating them into existing units of study. These lessons show how topics in your current curriculum lend themselves to examining the intersection of many forms of prejudice. And part three is the student-led service learning project. Using knowledge gained in part one and part two of the curriculum, students will work collaboratively to identify an animal-related problem in their community, brainstorm possible solutions, and plan and execute one of those solutions in order to bring about measurable change. Here's a message from one high school teacher who's using Challenging Assumptions lessons with her students. Hello, everyone. This is my mask. I love this. End species-ism, right? Isms. We don't need any more isms. And I'm here talking to you from Houston, Texas. Hello, y'all. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Challenging Assumptions, which is an amazing resource on the PETA website. I am Nina Otazo. I am a high school teacher, and I work here in Houston. I am one of many teachers who Teach Kind reached out to to help with creating this website called Challenging Assumptions. And I want to encourage you to check it out. I've used it, and I continue to use it, and I will use it because there is so much there to mine. There's so much there that you can make your own and to use with your students. I'll give you an example. Um, I created what's called a Pear Deck. I don't know if any of you are using that at the moment with virtual teaching. It's a great resource, but there's a lot of other ones out there like Padlet or Menti. And basically, the students get to respond in writing um, that everyone can see and respond to and react to as well, and we can discuss. And I've created um, lessons around social justice, around um, political activism, and in terms of uh, you know all beings being impacted, um, and how the interconnections between compassion and respect for some and not others, whether they're non-human or human. And my students are really responding to it. Um, this is such a great time to bring in these types of issues because of the, the tipping point, right? This movement that's happening around the disparity in treatment and bringing in the fact that um, this is not just true for human beings, right? Cats and dogs, they are considered companion animals. They are considered worthy of respect, of, of compassion, of kindness, of care, of rescuing, of being given um, treatment, medical treatment, uh, food, and yet animals for food are not considered in that way. So talking about that, and so one of the wonderful things on Challenging Assumptions is a video that um, with the link to Angela Davis, and it's just the last three minutes. And I can't tell you an entire class on just the last three minutes of Angela Davis about those specific acts of political activism, those events, and also about our treatment of animals and the political activism that um, in, in regards to just choosing not to eat them, right? It's a political act in and of itself. Great discussions, super, super robust discussions, exciting discussions, like a discussion about, well, animals are for food and humans are more intelligent and sentient. Right, and so the discussion that came out of this was the fact that um, my, you know, we have there are people we have um, animals that are in our homes that are not considered food, right? Like cats and dogs, 
like gerbils, like hamsters. They're not considered food. And so by stating animals are food, why are some not considered food and why are some considered food? So that was one aspect of it. Another one was discussing the fact that, you know, this whole idea of, of human beings being more intelligent and sentient and um, the fact that those same arguments have been used in terms of our rational, rationale for eating animals. It created a discussion and it created a conversation and it created excitement and interest about these particular types of ways of thinking. So I just, I, you gotta go to that website. There's so much there, y'all, so much. There's a social justice gallery walk with incredible pictures to use to give students a chance to respond to the pictures, to each other. Um, again, conversations that come out of this, they want to talk about this. This is real stuff, right? They want to hear about what matters. They want to, uh, people to understand disparity. They want people to understand the isms that they, that they are confronted with. And this is, gives, broadens that horizon, right? And it helps make those connections and for them to see things in a different way. One of the things that came out of it is the fact that my students were willing to consider that our treatment of animals for food might have an impact on how we treat each other, right, human beings, that, that the, considering that some are less them and some are not worthy of life, of compassion, of respect, that that may intersect and, it, in, and impact how we see other human beings. They were, they, they, they said they, that, you know, I, I have all this feedback saying I hadn't thought of it that way. That's something that I hadn't thought of and I, I can see how that might be the case. So I want to encourage you, challenging assumptions, um, it's a wonderful thing to, to use. It's so flexible. It's so much of our times. Um, and it's so important to give students an opportunity to have this kind of discussion, to, to be able to see beyond what is presented to them because they're really hungry for that. They really, really are. head into the next part of the workshop, practical applications. In this part, we'll discuss how challenging assumptions can be incorporated into the content areas of English language arts and social studies. Here's our guiding question to keep in mind. Just as white individuals, male individuals, and straight individuals must acknowledge their privilege in order to begin to address racism, sexism, and homophobia, Humans must acknowledge their privilege in order to address species of them. How can acknowledging our universal role as an oppressor of other animals guide us in our discussions of the intersectionality of social justice issues? We'll revisit this guiding question afterward. Our objective for this portion of the workshop is for you to learn some concrete ways you can use challenging assumptions in your curriculum. We design challenging assumptions to be a little less rigid than some of our elementary materials based on feedback we received from real high school teachers who shared with us that they prefer jumping off points. So take note of anything in the lesson we share with you that you feel could be a jumping off point for you in your own curriculum. We'll start off with a little more information about Gail and Mike and what led them to this work. Gail, can you talk briefly about your work at your school that was related to social justice topics? Absolutely. So let me start by letting you know what led me to humane education. So we talked about seeing people and animals as others. I come from a background where we were seen as others. I'm the child of Holocaust survivors and have lived my life with the repercussions and trauma that comes with that of being in a group discriminated against. We were the others, not them. I grew up feeling like the other and like the outsider. Now, as I was growing up, when I first saw pictures of puppy mills and factory farms, I felt as if I was seeing concentration camps that we have now created for pigs and cows and chickens and dogs. And I immediately felt an empathy and connection to the suffering of these creatures. It led me to humane education and to question why people take on the role of oppressors so easily. Throughout my teaching career, I have done presentations to classes and schools about my dad's story of his years in the camps 
And I always end with the idea that animals are living their own Holocaust. Thank you for sharing that, Gail. Now, Mike, you also have an interesting way of explaining your journey and what led you to humane education. Can you talk briefly about that? I went vegetarian in the mid 90s, probably about 25 years ago, um, solely for environmental reasons. I started to learn about the connection between animal agriculture and climate change. Um, and so it was largely just vegetarian um, up until probably about five years ago. Um, we actually, uh, my wife and I adopted our dog and um, we found out that she had been kept in a cage you know, for many years. And then something just kind of like snapped inside of us, something kind of broke and we made this connection. We kind of pierced through the speciesism that was within us that we could see our love for our dog, you know, didn't necessarily have to be any different than our love for other animals and the plight of other animals um, who are being treated in similar or even worse conditions. So that's when we really started to think about, um, you know, our own relationship with animals. And, you know, we went um, vegan as a result of that. But I've just been realizing even over these five years, each time I think I've kind of got this figured out is really just another layer of this that's just being pulled back. And so I'm realizing for myself, it's just going to be a, a lifelong journey of trying to understand my own speciesism and trying to, you know, work at that and, and work in the education system to uh, explore that with other educators and with students. Um, but, you know, one thing that was interesting is I have been asked this question is like, why did it take, you know, 40 plus years to kind of come to this realization and I you know I realized I've been in schools for almost my entire life either as a student or as a teacher and I've personally have never really been confronted or had to reckon with my relationship to um, animals you know especially animals that that are eaten or for entertainment I haven't had to reckon with that or face into that and, and I thought that was interesting you know that I know there are a lot of great resources out there, but just me personally, I kind of managed to get through these decades without um, having to, to look into this in a serious way. And so that's really something that, you know, myself and a number of other educators and teach kind are trying to do is trying to shift that um, relationship, especially amongst educators uh, to help students kind of get a better sense of this. Thank you, Mike. So blending animal issues into your ELA or social studies curriculum can not only engage and motivate students, but also broaden and enhance conversations about all sorts of content area topics. You can do what is expected with regard to the curriculum while also incorporating humane education. You don't need to have an animal issue explicitly mentioned in a book or unit of a study in order to discuss animal issues with students. One of the winners in our 2021 Teacher Appreciation Contest teaches global history in New York. She has students discuss how forms of industrialized development, such as the building of oil rigs, takes a toll on animals, their habitat, and the environment. She also encourages them to consider how historical events have negatively affected animals. For example, when the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima during World War II, captive animals and local wildlife suffered and died just as humans did. Her classes also examined advancements in technology like alternatives to animal-derived leather for car interiors and the shift from animal-based to plant-based food production and how these developments help animals improve the lives of humans and lower carbon emissions. Discussion of current events like climate change and the growing awareness of animal sentience and the rights of other species are all integral to a well-rounded social studies curriculum. So how do we broaden social justice discussions to include animals? Well, we can use what we learned from Dr. Spaniel and start by taking a look at our own beliefs. Let's do an activity from a lesson in challenging assumptions called Cognitive Dissonance and How Humans Treat Animals. It includes these two worksheets, statements about beliefs and statements about behavior. You can go to teachkind.org slash beliefsbehavior to fill out the digital version of the worksheets. Another option is to write out numbers one through five for each sheet on a piece of paper. Then take one minute to complete this. Read each statement and decide whether to choose yes or no. For the statements of belief sheet, 
Choose an answer that reflects what you believe to be factual given your awareness of the topic. For the statements of behavior sheet, make sure you're truthful in answering each question, regardless of your answers to questions about your beliefs, even if you notice inconsistencies. Inconsistencies between attitudes and actions are very normal. You can pause the video if you need a bit more time. So this is for your own personal use and you don't need to share your responses with anyone else. This activity may shine a spotlight on some cognitive dissonance and that's okay. As Dr. Spaniel mentioned, cognitive dissonance is when you have inconsistent thoughts, beliefs, or attitudes related to behavioral decisions. And most people have experienced this at one point or another. The key here is choosing to grow after we recognize a point of cognitive dissonance. And studies have shown that this can be a very powerful tool to help students make positive changes in their lives. Now I'm going to ask Gail and Mike to talk about some examples of lessons and activities they've implemented in their own classrooms, how students have responded, and whether they've seen students make positive changes after recognizing any cognitive dissonance. Gail, can you tell us about your experiences? Yes, I can. So one of the first things that I had done uh, recent years was I started a Teens for Animal Rights Club. So the students had vegan bake sales. They were also invited to speak to middle school students, we were high school, on ways in which they can begin to help animals at a younger age. They participated in local city council hearings, state humane lobby day, they had pet food and towel drives, and they also visited a local shelter to learn how shelters work to help animals in need. In one of my ELA classes, we studied horses and how they have been used in times of war as animals in entertainment and as working horses. And because we were here in New York City, we got to be part of the Lincoln Center High School program. And so students were able to see the fantastic Broadway show War Horse as a culminating activity. We also utilized films like Lolita, Slave to Entertainment, we also created a current events wall for animal issues, which we found on an almost daily basis. I'd also like to add that during our discussion on dog fighting, the principal came in, loved it so much, I was granted tenure on the spot. In my writing class, we utilized story starters centered around animals. Here are some examples. Lolly, the six-year-old lab, sat in her cage and watched people pass her by day after day, and suddenly, as I walked down the quiet street, I felt eyes on me. I heard a sound from the distance. Was it a call for help? So students can also write a story from an animal point of view, such as if I were a blank, my life would look like. There are also lots of mid story and end of story sentences that can be used for students to really be challenged and learn how to write a story to come to that conclusion. Thank you, Gail. You mentioned some great resources like the book War Horse and the documentary film Lolita Slave to Entertainment. Links to all the resources mentioned can be found at teachkind.org slash challenging assumptions training. Mike? You know, one example is my grade 10 uh, geography class, Geography of Asia. And um, we, in the past, have watched this film, The Cove by Luis de Hoyos. Uh, they won the best uh, documentary Oscar about a decade ago, and, and that's looking at the dolphin hunt in Taiji, Japan. And that was interesting is when the students watch this film, they're, they're kind of horrified you know, by what they see in this dolphin hunt. And then 
some of the dolphins are eaten. Um, a lot of them are also sent abroad to resorts or to aquariums. And, and you get to see kind of behind the veil what actually, you know, where these animals are coming from, how they're treated, and, and kind of, you know, get to see their experience of this uh, whole food and entertainment kind of industry on that. And so there's a strong kind of emotional reaction from the students against that. But then the second part of that lesson is also looking at um, our relationship to animals, you know, maybe close to home, for example, you know, in North America, the, the sheer number of of um, cows and pigs and chickens that are eaten. Um, and the numbers of, you know, of those compared to, you know, the numbers of dolphins, it's, there's this was like a, a drop in the bucket. So it's, it's that, that kind of um, puts them in a challenging position to, to, to see their own kind of cognitive dissonance with this. On the one hand, they're, they're horrified by what's going on with the dolphin hunt. And yet on the other hand, you know, the, the consumption of, of animals or, seeing animals as entertainment in, in our local aquarium or our local petting zoos or theme parks, um, they just start to see that actually those, there's a lot of overlap between those two. So, you know, it's, it's interesting with students because they don't necessarily have enough agency, you know, they're living with their families and might not have much choice to make decisions, but at least you can see the wheels starting to turn within them. And, and some of them have um, made changes, you know, to their diet or uh, made changes in terms of what they're going to uh, do in terms of animal entertainment and, and boycotting things like that. So that's been really inspiring to see. And then another uh, activity I've done with my students, especially during the pandemic, is uh, virtual field trips to animal uh, sanctuaries. So um, those are, I've done that with grade seven geography classes and um, you know, we have this, this kind of setup for this. It's usually a month long project. And so the first part of this is understanding what is an animal sanctuary, you know, and, and comparing that to, you know, traditional zoo or and then roadside zoos and theme parks and, and shelters. And how, how, do the, how do they all differ? A lot of times they're just kind of lumped together. And then we actually go and, and we've done these virtual live visits to uh, primate sanctuaries. And also the happily ever after farm sanctuary, sanctuary outside of Toronto as well for farmed animals. And you know, it was interesting. The reactions from the students with that was just um, they were so surprised to see animals, especially with the farm animals, seeing animals like that that were just in such a different environment than what they kind of had expected. You know, they're in the sanctuary where their needs are put first, where they're allowed to live out the rest of their natural lives. You know, they're, they're front and center. And usually I think for students, and I think for a lot of us, including myself, you know, up until a few years ago, it was just either animals or those types of animals are out of sight, out of mind, or, you know, we just see them in one particular way. It's just, you know, their food on our plates or you know, something we wear. So, so for them, there was, there was this kind of like a lot of aha moments of like, wow, like I just had no idea that pigs could live that long. Or I had no idea that cows had such rich social lives or, you know, just th things like that, just being able to see animals in their, you know, in their natural state, I guess, for lack of a better term. So, um, so that, that was a very powerful experience with the students as well. Thank you, Mike. Great practical ideas connected to your curriculum. Again, links to all the resources mentioned can be found on the TeachKind website. Now we're going to take a look at the first lesson in the curriculum, which is a gallery walk lesson that helps students look at parallels between animal abuse and human abuse and examine the causes and effects of discrimination. Have students do the gallery walk by looking at images of animals. The images are included in the curriculum, so you can print them out and hang them on the wall for an in-person class or upload them to a virtual platform if needed. This is what it would look like on the virtual platform Padlet, but the images can be uploaded to other virtual platforms as well. The teacher's guide provides instructions for both in-person and virtual classes. Have students look at the images and write whatever thoughts or feelings come to mind. Let students know that they can write as little as one word, such as suffering, or as much as a few sentences. They can respond to someone else's comment too. Since the students have had the opportunity to respond to the images in writing without judgment from their peers, some may be more willing to share their thoughts in a group conversation. You can initiate and guide the discussion by asking these questions. What did you notice as you participated in the gallery walk? 
Which comments did you respond to? Which comments received the most attention? Why? What similarities did you notice among the images? What differences did you notice? If you had to give this exhibition a title, what would it be and why? The next step in the lesson is to have students work in groups and assign each group one of these videos to watch and respond to. Why feminists must reject all violence, not just violence against humans. Animal rights is not a white thing. And civil rights icon inspired this lawyer to push the boundaries of animal rights. We encourage you to watch these videos at your leisure and also revisit your responses to the beliefs and behavior worksheet. Being honest with yourself. It is possible for us to believe certain things and not necessarily align our actions with our beliefs. These issues are sure to get kids talking, whether they agree or not. So you're promoting thoughtful dialogue and helping them learn to treat each other respectfully during their discourse, a skill we could use a lot more of these days. There are journal prompts that the students can respond to in order to wrap up the lesson and provide you with evidence that they're questioning the status quo or responding thoughtfully to diverse perspectives. Where in the curriculum can you fit these types of lessons in? Here are some helpful things to consider. Think about the last unit you taught and where there might be a landing spot for a discussion about animals. What could you try next time? What standards or units will you be covering soon? You can brainstorm ways to integrate some of these lessons and videos. And you can always contact TeachKind if you need help figuring this out. Well, we hope you've gotten a good idea about ways to use challenging assumptions with your class and how various aspects of it can be used as jumping off points. Once you start using the curriculum, you'll likely start seeing other opportunities for incorporating these ideas in an effective way. Now we'll wrap things up and talk about additional TeachKind resources. The heart of part three of the curriculum is a service learning project, so students can put into practice what they've learned in parts one and two. Dr. Spaniel, can you discuss how cognitive dissonance can be a huge source of unhappiness and how research on service shows that it can lead to more happiness? I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, there's, um, first of all, this whole idea of cognitive dissonance. I mentioned it before, you know, when our beliefs and our behavior, um, when we discover they're not aligned, that's when we experience cognitive dissonance, right? Um, when you start learning about, you know, sentience of, of non-human animals, but, you know, you eat them and you wear them, well, that doesn't feel good. So the brain needs to do something to resolve this conflict. Um, and, you know, you can choose to change your beliefs or you can choose to change your behavior. Typically, people do what's easiest. And that's when we have justifications and denial and, and um you know, a whole myriad of, of psychological mechanisms we use to feel better. I often share this image with my students and it's a cartoon image of uh, a person behind a desk that says comforting lies. And then next to that person is another person behind a desk that says unpleasant truths. And there's a long winding line to comforting lies and nobody's in line for the unpleasant truths, right? None of us want that. And the truth is, you know, when it comes to cognitive dissonance, the unpleasant truths are really what helps us to grow. When we feel uncomfortable, that's when you know you're growing. <laughs> and you just got to stick with it, right? It's like when you have a dirty shirt and you throw it in the laundry and it gets twisted and it's like, eh, but then it comes out clean, you know, and beautiful and smells good. When we, that's why it's called growing pains, you know, when we are uncomfortable, we grow. So I make it a goal to be comfortable with being uncomfortable because then I know I'm on the right track. So, you know, cognitive dissonance is uncomfortable, but you know, you work through it and you grow. I try to make the most ethical choices that will lead to the least amount of suffering. And that is what I guide my students to do if they choose to. I always hope they do, but you know, most of the time they want to, sometimes they don't, um, at least in the moment, who knows what will happen later. Uh, but in the field of positive psychology, there's a lot of evidence. Um, if we need the evidence, I think people just know that when you do something for others, it feels good. Uh, but we do have the psychological research to back that up. Um, and in that field, we can see that when we do service, when we do things for others, it boosts our own happiness. And, um, you know, it's a win-win. You do something for others and you automatically feel good. 
Um, but on a very real level, it's not just about feeling good. We must respect and care for other animals and the environment if we want to be okay. And my hope is that we all know how all life interconnects so that if we harm a non-human animal or the environment, it's like we're harming ourselves. How are my choices impacting others and what can I do uh, to do better? And I'll just end with the Maya Angelou quote that I love, once you know better, you should do better. You can do better once you know better. So that's my goal, just to support people in that journey of, of knowing and doing better. Let's revisit our guided question from earlier. Perhaps you're examining a text through the feminist lens with your ELA class. You might consider exploring the ways humans exploit the reproductive systems of female animals, such as cows for their milk and chickens for their eggs. Maybe you're teaching about the bombing of Hiroshima in your global history class. As mentioned earlier, you might consider having a discussion with students about ways it affected the wildlife in the area. In addition to challenging assumptions, TeachKind has countless resources for teaching compassion for animals at the high school level. One of my favorites is our teaching with film discussion questions. There are so many thought-provoking animal rights documentaries out there, and we know teachers and students love a good movie day. So we create questions and activities to go along with these films. Our debate kits are chock full of articles and other resources about various animal-related issues, such as the negative effects of animal agriculture on the environment. Students can use these to develop an oral or a written argument. We have lessons and materials to go along with books that have animal rights themes. We're always seeking to expand our list of compassionate books for students. So if you're aware of any good ones, please let us know about them. And our rescue stories are great for sharpening students' reading comprehension skills while building empathy for animals. Each worksheet tells the story of an animal who was helped by kind humans and comprehension questions, vocabulary words, and an answer key are included. Most of the rescue stories have compelling videos to go along with them. Thanks, Megan. Here's Miss Willie's story.
Gail, can you give us your closing thoughts from UFT Humane Education Committee? Thank you to TeachKind for collaborating with the United Federation of Teachers. We hope you found this informative and helpful. Again, please visit our website for more information on UFT Humane Education Committee and view our links to fantastic and free resources, including the link to TeachKind. You can also send me an email at galefred at aol.com so that we can add you to our email list as we have some more exciting workshops. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And please contact us at info at teachkind.org for any additional assistance you may need. We're always happy to support compassionate educators like you. Please visit teachkind.org for more free lessons and other resources and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, and Teachers Pay Teachers. Have a wonderful day.